Hello, everyone. Um, this is the last lecture in the series of the complex numbers. Um, so in this video, I'm going to go over um, a few things. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, how you are going to um, solve um, linear equations that have complex variables easily uh, with MATLAB. Um, because this this video is based on MATLAB, the, how you basically uh, can manipulate the complex numbers using MATLAB. So first, I'm going to start with how you can uh, manipulate linear equations with complex numbers using MATLAB, and you will see how easy it is. And many times I have seen again, a student is struggling with that because again, there's a there's a um, some sort of uh, fear involved. Uh, whenever students see complex numbers in an equation. And there's a, and I think the fear is because they start solving um, those numbers, those equations um, using simple calculators without realizing how easy it is uh, if they just assign uh, variables to these numbers. And then whether you're using a scientific calculator, programmable calculator, or a tool like MATLAB, uh, you can just use variables instead of punching numbers all the time that lead to waste uh, more time. And if you punch incorrect numbers, of course, you can get incorrect result. Uh, but if you put everything in terms of variables, how easy it is to manipulate complex numbers, uh, because there is really no difference. Uh, if you're using variables, there is no difference uh, as in the manipulation of equations or numbers, uh, whether the numbers are real numbers or complex numbers, because you are just using variables. Um, so we're going to start with that. And then I'm going to show you uh, some specific functions in MATLAB or Octave. Uh, Octave is a free version of MATLAB, which is Linux based, but it works on Windows as well. And the environment is pretty close to uh, MATLAB environment. Um, so I'm going to discuss some of the very specific functions that are present in Octave and MATLAB that um, deal with the complex numbers. You can um, you know, calculate the polar form from rectangular form and the phase from rectangular form and all those things. And towards the end, I'm going to show you how to write a very uh, small functions, uh, very small function that can help you again with the manipulation of uh, complex numbers in Octave or MATLAB. Uh, one thing in MATLAB or Octave is that um, in, in, in an equation, in an expression, uh, the complex numbers, they have to be written in rectangular form in order for them to multiply, divide, uh, or do anything. Uh, in many of the programmable calculators, uh, you can manipulate complex numbers in either form, uh, whether they are in the polar form or rectangular form. Unfortunately, in MATLAB, it has to be in rectangular form. Uh, but it is quite easy if the number is given in polar form, then you can write a small function instead of first uh, converting that number into rectangular and then using that uh, in the equation or expression. You can just write a small function and you can just call the function anytime the number is in polar form. And that function basically first going to convert the number into rectangular uh, form and then uh, use that number in the equation or the expression. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start with, let's see, I'm going to share the whole screen. And then we will start. With um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with an example in circuit analysis um, in this analysis of steady state um, sinusoidal uh, functions or the circuit that uses steady state sinusoid. Uh, and of course, we have complex numbers in in the equation of that circuit. So we will see how to write the linear equation and how to solve those linear equation using MATLAB. Now, if you're, you know, if you're not familiar with circuit analysis, if you, you know, you're a mechanical engineer or some other engineer, you do, of course, use, I, you know, I'm assuming you do use linear equations or solution of linear equation, or you know, solve equations uh, or variables um, from uh, the linear equation. So it applies to anyone who is trying to solve for the unknown variables uh, from linear equation whether you are electrical engineering or, or mechanical or computer or any field or simply a student in math. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna show you. And this, but this will be very useful for students who are 
electrical concentration. So let's assume that I have a circuit and my pen is not working very well, so bear with me. It's not a very nice depiction of the circuit. So let's say I have this circuit. I have a voltage source. And this voltage source is represented by complex number. And I'm going to call Vs with the value of 10 angle 30 degrees volt. And this is what we call phasor form of the source. The source is actually a time dependent source. It's a sinusoidal function. But again, it's not the explanation of circuit analysis, so we're not going to go in that. I'm going to call this resistor R1, assign the value, uh, let's say 100 ohms. I'm going to call this inductor, the reactance of the inductor XL1, and call this uh, or assign the value J120 ohms. I'm going to call this. Xc, since there is only one capacitor, I'll just call this Xc and assign the value of negative J 100 ohms. This is resistor two with the value of, uh, let's just go ahead and give 200 ohm and resistor three with the value of 300 ohms. It will be easier to remember R1, R2, R3, 100, 200, 300. And let's call this Xl2 with the value uh, J uh, 150 ohm or whatever. So inductors and capacitors, uh, their reactants depend on the frequency. And uh, at the frequency at which the, the circuit is operating, the, that frequency is not given to you. But at, the, at that frequency, the values of Xc and Xl are the ones that are shown in the circuit. So these values are completely random values. Uh, you don't have to worry about the values. The basic idea is, uh, you know, I'm going to write the equation, linear equations, uh, to solve for, let's say, if I want to solve for, these two voltages, node one and node two. So let's say node one voltage is V1 and node two voltage is V2. And for that, I'm going to use nodal analysis. Another problem can be solved, of course, by combining all the impedance together on the reactance and resistance uh, to find an equivalent resistance or equivalent impedance rather, find the total current and then expand this uh, to find V1 and V2. It can be solved you know, in many different ways. Uh, I'm just going to write down linear equation specifically using nodal analysis. So I'm going to call this current coming at node 1, I1. I'm going to call this current IL1. I'm going to call this current IC. This is I2. And then this current, which is going to flow in both R3 and XL2, let's call this current I3. So these are my current that are going towards each of the node. And again, if you are a student of electrical circuits, uh, then or electrical engineering, and you have done circuit analysis, then this will make more sense to you. But again, just bear with me because the main idea is to write linear equations and then to solve those. And of course, those linear equations will have complex numbers, but um, observe that I'm using variables to express each quantity. And that's one of the things actually every student, whether you're doing math or you're doing engineering, um, you should do. Uh, there's a reason that everyone study algebra and um, you use variables uh, because it, using variables just make your life extremely easy. There is less chances of making errors because the more you're going to punch numbers, either in the calculator or uh, you know computer program, uh, there will be more chances that you can make mistake uh, when you're punching one number over and over again. And uh, it just takes more time. Uh, so to save time uh, and to reduce the chances of errors, um, I will highly recommend anytime you're solving equations, you're doing manipulation, uh, you're using uh, expressions, just assign variables and use those variables until the very end. When you have the final expression, final equation, 
then you go ahead and uh, if you're using computer program or, or calculator and you already have assigned the values to those variables, just use those variables to solve um, your expression. Uh, you don't really need to write numbers to be very honest. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, apply KCL at node one. And again, don't worry about it if you don't know what I'm doing, because the last thing that you will see is a set of two linear equations, and then we're gonna solve those. So at KCL, uh, I1 is going towards node one and IL1 and IC are going away from node one. So I'm just gonna write down equation I1 is equal to IL1 plus IC. And from that, I can write down in terms of Ohm's law, I1 is Vs minus V1 over R1. And IL1 is simply V1 over XL1. And IC is V1 minus V2 over XC. So V1 and V2 are my unknown variables and rest of the values I know. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna keep V1 and V2 on one side and then Vs on the other side. So I have, I'm gonna take this V1, let's say, and move it on this side. So I have V1, one over R1 from this, one over XL1 from this, and one over XC from third one minus V2 over XC is equal to Vs over R1. And I will call this equation one. All right, next I'm going to apply KCL at node two. So this node, and I have IC going towards the node and I2 and I3 going away from the node. So, Total current going towards the node should be equal to the total current going away from the node. And IC, of course, is V1 minus V2 over XC. V1 minus V2 over XC. I2 is uh, V2 over R2. V2 over R2. And I3 is V2. And I'm assuming, of course, that this is my crown. So V2 minus 0 over R2. So then um, my I3 is uh, V2 minus 0 over R3 plus XL2. So V3 or V2 over R3 plus XL2. So again, I'm going to write the equation in terms of V1 and V2 on one side and anything else on the other side. So I have V1 again, um, common L factor is XC is the only thing here. So V1 over XC and I'm going to bring all these V2 on left side plus or minus rather would be a better sign. Minus V2, one over XC plus one over R2 plus one over R3 plus XL2 equals zero. When you bring V2, this um, expression and this expression on the left side, of course, both signs will be negative. So I just put the negative outside. Um, and this is my equation number two. So now I have two equations and I have two variables to solve for V1 and V2. Uh, and we can use matrix inversion method to solve this. So uh, using matrix inversion method, basically I can write the two equations down as coefficients of V1 and V2 from the two equations. So from the first equation, I have one over R1 plus one over XL1 plus one over XC. One over R1 plus one over XL1 plus one over XC. That's the coefficient of V1 in the first one, right here. And the coefficient of V2 is negative one over XC. Negative one over XC. And from the second equation, coefficient of V1 is one over XC. And coefficient of V2 is negative. 
of I don't have to put uh, negative one over x c minus one over r two minus one over r three plus x l two. And this will be multiplied by V1, V2. So I'm writing the equation down in matrix form, those two linear equations. And that is going to be equal to the um, right side, which are the constant value from the first one. Constant value is Vs over R1. And from the second one, the constant value is zero. So these are my linear equation written in terms of matrices. Now I can call this matrix, matrix A. I can call this matrix matrix V, and I can call this matrix matrix K or matrix C to represent constant. So basically, the two linear equations are represented in terms of A, V is equal to K. And to find the two variables, V1 and V2, that is to find the value of matrix V or vector V, all I have to do is to apply the inverse of A times K. And this times, of course, is matrix multiplication. So this is the operation that we're going to be applying. First, we're going to define all the variables. Then we calculate A. Uh, and then we calculate the inverse of A and K. But again, it is extremely simple to do that if you're using uh, either a programmable calculator that can do this, uh, the, the matrix inversion and all those things. And most of the programmable calculators can do that. And you will see on your screen how easy it is to do in Octave or MATLAB. So let's go ahead and open uh, Octave. I'm gonna go ahead and clear my, clear my screen. And the first thing I'm going to do, and you should do the same thing anytime you, again, are solving something uh, where you can assign variables. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to assign all these variables and the values of those variables in the MATLAB or in the Octave environment. So Vs is 10 angle 30. Now, remember I told you that in Octave or MATLAB, the complex number has to be written in terms of rectangular coordinates. So 10 angle 30 is, uh, complex number written in polar form. So I'm gonna go ahead and convert that into rectangular form, 10 times cosine D. Cosine D means, uh, it's a MATLAB function basically. Um, cosine D means that the phase is in degrees instead of radians. If it is in radians, then you can just use COS or COS. 30 uh, plus I times, N times sine D of 30. I or J in MATLAB represent the uh, imaginary number. So we assign the value of Vs. Uh, we calculate the value of Vs in rectangular form and assign basically to the variable Vs. And the rest of the values are R1 is 100, R2 is 200, R3 is 300 um, XL1 is 120 IL 120J. XL2 is 150I or 150J. And XC is negative 100I. So all these values have been assigned in Octave, MATLAB, whichever, whatever you're using. And just make sure that all the values are correct because if the values are correct, then as long as you're writing the equation correctly, your results will be correct. But if you make mistake in assigning some value, anytime you use that value, your, uh, of course your result is going to be incorrect. So just make sure that uh, recheck at least one time that all the values that you're assigning are correct. So we have R100, R200, R300. Those are the values that I assigned in the circuit. XL1, XL1 is 120J, XL2 is 150J and Xc is negative 100. Just so these values are correct. Uh, next, I'm going to go ahead and write down the matrix A. So A is equal to matrix 1 over R1 
plus one over XL one plus one over X. That's my first row, first column. First row, second column is a negative one over XC. Then I go to the next row by using semicolon. And first, uh, second row, first column, one over XC. And second row, second column, negative one over XC minus one over R2 minus one over R3 plus XL2. So observe all the complex numbers are already calculated here and you see the result on your screen. So you don't really have to be struggling with the complex numbers, um, you know, putting the values, individual values, calculating at each step. You don't have to do anything, just use variables. And now my K vector is uh, Vs over R1, Vs over R1, first column uh, or first row and the second row is zero. And of course there's only one column. So this is my, this is my K vector. And now in MATLAB, you can use the function INV to calculate the inverse of a vector. There are multiple ways you can do that. I'll show you all of them. INV is a specific function to calculate the inverse of a matrix. So inverse of A times K. And that will give you the result. You can also, if you're uh, trying to find the, the, um, you know, the, the unknown variables from the linear equation and you're taking the inverse, you can also do V is equal to A uh, backslash K. So that will also calculate first the inverse of A and then multiply it by K is the same result you're gonna get. And the third one is you can also do a negative power of a, which is inverse times k. So all of them are valid and all of, all of them will produce the same result. A backslash k is faster. So if you if you're um, solving it using matrix inversion method, a linear equation, then you just use a backslash k. But INV is the proper function in MATLAB to do that. Uh, anytime if, if you forget how to do it, just IN, use INV, which goes along with inverse. So you see two results here, and these are my voltage values. So I'm going to go ahead and put those values here. And let's, oops, let's go ahead and write those values. Let's copy. And you can just write down, don't have to write it actually because you can see them on the screen anyways. So these are my value, these are two voltages. Now, most of the time, anytime in circuit analysis, especially if you are representing uh, voltages and currents in rectangular form, your final result is supposed to be in polar form in terms of magnitude and phase. Uh, because if you're going from the phasor domain, that is the the, the frequency domain, complex frequency domain into the time domain, then you need uh, the magnitude of the quantity and you need the phase of the quantity to convert back into time domain. And again, again, it's not a circuit analysis course or anything, so I'm not gonna show you that, but you do need to convert that into uh, polar form. So of course, you know, by this time, this is a fourth lecture, by this time, you know how to convert a rectangular number into polar form. In MATLAB or Octave specifically, there are functions, ABS, absolute value. So if I wanna convert magnitude of V, then you can use ABS, absolute value of the complex number to get the magnitude and to get the phase. And these are just the variables that I'm assigning. You don't have to assign mag v or phase v, any variable that you want. I'm, I just like to hold values that I'm using because I can use those values without re-entering those values if I have those saved in some variable. So a phase in MATLAB, the function is angular. 
An angle actually will produce the correct phase. It will take care of if the point is in second quadrant or in the third quadrant. So based on the complex point, wherever it is located, it will adjust the phase of that point. If you use the uh, inverse tan function, remember we discussed that uh, in the first lecture of the series, if you're using inverse tan or tan inverse function, tan inverse of y over x, uh, you have to be careful if the point is located in the second quadrant or third quadrant, because it can give you, if the point is in the second quadrant, it, can, it will give you the angle uh, in the uh, fourth quadrant. And if the point is in the third quadrant, then it can give you angle in the uh, first quadrant. Um, so you have to adjust basically 180 degrees or negative 180 degrees uh, based on where the point is located. And again, if you forget about that, or if you did not go over the first lecture, uh, video lecture, then make sure to check that out first, uh, where we converted uh, rectangular form into polar form and polar form into rectangular form. Uh, in MATLAB, angle is the function. Uh, that can do that. So angle of V and angle basically gives you angle in radians. So if you want the angle in degrees, then just multiply that by 180 and divide that by pi. So basically what you have 6.0812 is V1 with the phase of 46.995 or 47 degrees and 5.255 is V2 with the phase of 88.491. So both voltages, of course, units will be volt. So V1 is going to be 6.0812 angle 47 degrees volt, and V2 will be 5.25 angle 88.5 degrees volt. And that is your result if you're looking for both the voltages. So I showed you how easy it is to um, solve the linear equations uh, in MATLAB if the contents of the linear equations uh, are um, complex basically instead of real, but you can do the same for with real basically, right? I mean, all I'm using are variables. So irrespective of the variables are uh, complex or real, the method is going to be the same. So if you if you are again electrical uh, electrical engineering uh, student, and if you are dealing with the DC uh, voltages and DC current instead of AC voltages AC current, DC there is no complex, everything is real. You can use the same method, assign everything to variables and observe how easy it is when you assign everything to variable. Uh, I don't have to punch any number except at the beginning when I'm, I'm assigning values to those variables. And once I did that, everything is straightforward. I'm just putting my variables in the program. You can do the same in your calculators, but this will save you a lot of time. And uh, the basic idea here is that you have understanding of how you can write the equations. And of course, uh, once you have those equations, then you can always solve them using um, some device calculators, MATLAB, whatever. So um, absolute uh, is one of the functions, as I said, and angle is the other function that you can use with uh, complex number. Now there are some built-in function in uh, MATLAB that can convert polar form into rectangular and rectangular into polar. If you're going from uh, polar into rectangular, so polar into rectangular. The function is uh, pole to cart. So let me show you an example. So for example, um, let's say I have variable Q is equal to pole to cart. Actually pole to cart is going to give you X and Y separately. So I'm gonna, instead of doing Q, I'm gonna do X comma Y as my output variable. Pole to cart. And now pole to cart takes your phase first in radians and your magnitude second. So again, there are two input variables. Your phase is first. So let's say my phase is uh, 56 degrees. So I'm gonna convert that 56 degrees times pi by 180 to convert that into radians. And let's say my magnitude is 120. So that's going to show you what will be the value of X and what will be the value of Y. So if you wanna make a complex number from this, then you can make a complex number, let's say X plus I times Y. And that is going to be your complex number with X being the real part and Y being the imaginary part. So pole to cart is a built-in function. Again, the problem with pole to cart is what? 
Uh, in general, when you are solving, um, when you're converting a polar number into rectangular number, generally we have magnitude and we have phase and phase is usually in degrees. And we expect that the, the resultant number is going to be our rectangular um, number, uh, basically complete rectangular, uh, complete complex number in rectangular form, uh, not separate values, real value separate and uh, imaginary value separate. Uh, so, but again, this is a built-in function. Um, and then opposite is car to pole. And in car to pole, basically you convert, convert uh, converting rectangular form into polar form. So again, there are two output variables. <clears throat> the first variable is uh, your uh, phase. I'm gonna call it theta. And the second variable is your magnitude. So phase and magnitude is equal to R2 pole and the input are X and Y. So I'm just gonna take X and Y that we calculated X comma Y and we'll convert that into polar form. Now, once again, theta is in radians, not in degrees. So if you have to convert that, then you have to multiply it by 180 divided by pi. So 150, 120 degrees and 56 degree is your, uh, 120 is the magnitude and 56 degree is your phase. If you're converting um, 67.103 plus J99.485 into polar form. So remember these two functions, pole to card, card to pole. Um, remember angle, absolute, angle, absolute are, um, you know, they come handy all the time. Uh, so remember angle, remember absolute. Now, if you have um, some equation written, some expression that you are evaluating, let's say your expression is um, a function f is equal to two plus three i five plus seven i seven j seven i whatever. Um, two angle 15 degrees plus five angle 22 degrees divided by one plus three i times three angle 22 degrees. Let's say you're solving this expression. Of course, a complex number. Some numbers are written in rectangular form, some numbers are written in polar form. Now, I think most of the calculator, programmable calculators or scientific calculator, uh, they can, uh, you can manipulate these equations um, the way it is written. That is, you can manipulate rectangular uh, coordinate numbers and polar coordinate numbers or polar form number, uh, basically in the same equation. In MATLAB, unfortunately, or Octave, you cannot do that. You, you need to have each number written in rectangular form. So a couple of ways to do it. One way, of course, that you first go ahead and change each of these numbers into rectangular form. And remember to change these numbers. Either you can use the function that I showed you, uh, which is polar to, uh, polar to Cartesian, or you can just write down each number as a two cosine of 15 degrees plus J two sine of 15 degrees to convert this into rectangular and do the same for the other. That's a longer process a little bit. Now towards the end, this is almost the end. I'm gonna show you how to do it more efficiently in MATLAB or Octave. So what you need to do is to create a function. So functions are uh, programs that you can call from other programs or from uh, MATLAB or Octave command window. And when they are called, basically whatever uh, is the objective of that program is, objective of this that function is, uh, it is executed and the result is sent back to the place where the function was called. So what I'm going to create a function in front of you is a function that uh, when you enter uh, a polar uh, complex number in polar form, that is the magnitude and phase and my magnitude uh, it's going to come first, phase is going to come second, and phase is going to be in degrees. Because again, observe all of the angles are in degrees. Uh, then it will generate the equivalent rectangular number. And anytime I'm doing any calculation, all I have to do is to call that function. Instead of first converting the number into rectangular form, I'm just going to call that function. And that function is going to convert the number into rectangular form and substitute 
that number in place of the polar form number where it is required. So I'm gonna create this function in front of you. Function, and let's call this function um, P2C, polar to Cartesian. Polar to Cartesian, pole to card is all, already exists. There's a built-in function of MATLAB. So I'm gonna call my function P2C. Uh, before that, I'm gonna assign an output variable. Let's say my output variable is A and P2C, and my input variables are magnitude and phase of the complex number. I'm gonna go ahead and save this. And let's see, function has to be saved in the same directory. So I'm in C users and jaws, and I'm gonna go ahead and save, control S. Uh, let's go ahead and save. Uh, am I in the same file? Let's, yeah, I think I'm in the same. I'm just gonna go ahead and save in um, let's see if I have a MATLAB folder here. I don't have a MATLAB folder, so uh, documents maybe. Oh, right here, MATLAB folder. So I'm gonna go ahead and save in the MATLAB folder. So documents MATLAB. Oh, it doesn't let me to save it here. So I'm gonna go ahead and save somewhere else. That's a teaching, that's my own folder. I'm just gonna save it here. Okay, that folder for some reason was restricted. Okay, so I, I saved that. And if I have to call the function, I will be, I should be in the same directory. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and change my directory to where I am in the PG folder. So I'm in this directory and P2C is right over here. So um, make sure that the function is saved. Again, uh, there are two things with functions. Function should be named, uh, the file should be named the same as your function name if, in order for you to call the function. And second, uh, it should be saved in the same folder uh, from where you're calling the function. So if if you're calling the function uh, from your command window, then this should be the folder in which it should be saved. Uh, you can also save a function in the MATLAB uh, default folders that basically uh, default folders are the one that uh, when MATLAB or Octave start, then those folders uh, are in the path of MATLAB uh, programs. So any any function that is called basically MATLAB can go and check those folders and see if the function is located in, in that folder. Like, you know, built-in function cosine and all those things. So those are uh, already uh, initiated at the start of MATLAB or Octave. So anyways, going back to this, uh, function A, P to CMT, and all I have to do is I know magnitude. So A is equal to magnitude times cosine D of T plus I times uh, magnitude times sine d of d. And that is it, it's as simple as that. All I'm doing is I'm taking uh, m cosine d of t to calculate the real part of complex number and m sine d of t to calculate the complex part uh, or imaginary part, multiply that by of course iota. And that is assigned to the output variable a. So anytime I'm going to call this function, uh, the value will be calculated, assigned to A and uh, in my program, wherever um, I'm using that function, A value will be sent to replace uh, replace that, um, that function that I'm calling basically. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you now how easy it is to evaluate this expression in MATLAB. So let's go ahead and let me see what expression is it. Let me clear my screen. So my f is equal to, and again, you don't have to write f. I'm just, I'm just holding the value of that. Two plus three i times five plus seven i times. Now two angle fifteen. I'm going to call my function p two c. Who is the magnitude? Fifteen degrees. The case. So p two c. 215 
plus P2C. 5 is the magnitude, 22 is the place. Everything is divided by, so I'm going to put everything in the numerator in parentheses. Everything is divided by the denominator. 1 plus 3i times P2C, 322. And again, everything in the denominator should also be in parentheses. And when you execute it, you get the result of this expression. So whenever you are going to enter the uh, complex number given in the polar form uh, using the function that you develop P2C, then basically it is going to calculate the equivalent. It's going to calculate the equivalent number in, uh, presented in the rectangular form, assign it to the variable A, and this variable A is going to be substituted anytime you call that function. So P2C 522, basically five angle 22. Uh, anytime I call this, basically the value of A is going to come and it's going to be plugged in over here. So you don't have to do anything uh, separately. You don't have to first convert every number from polar form to rectangular form and then go ahead and use them in equation. Uh, you don't have to do any of those things. All you have to do is to just create a small function, call the function and uh, simplify it in basically one step. Uh, I believe that is about it. I hope uh, that this video um, will be useful for you. Uh, and especially if you are an engineering student, if you are a math student and you are struggling with complex numbers, um, I hope that this four video series that I develop, um, you know, it, it will be useful for you and it will help you with your studies.